And good afternoon, everyone. And once again, a huge welcome to all of you joining us today for this presentation as part of the NADP Virtual Conference 2020. It's my privilege and pleasure to be here. I hope you're all safe and well. And I've so far over the last few weeks enjoyed a very productive virtual conference with NADP. And today, of course, I'm going to be focusing on choice and voice. And we're going to be looking at choice and voice specifically through the lens of technology. So the approaches of choice and voice are how we can take those and utilize those to our best advantage within uh, all of the environments that we work with to benefit both our colleagues and also, of course, our students. And so we'll be looking through a few slides today. We'll be looking at a few practical examples of technology and where they fit, and hopefully be giving you a few core recommendations as to how we can start to focus on enabling more choice and voice with the students that we serve, and also to ensure that they can achieve their very best by having that choice and voice. And so I'm gonna go through a number of slides today, uh, and we're gonna have a look, first of all, just in terms of who I am, uh, so my name is Patrick McGrath. I am education technology strategist here at a company called Textelp, who you may have heard of. And at any stage after today, of course, you can feel free to reach out to me. You can get me at edtech at texthelp.com or please do follow me on Twitter at th underscore Patrick M. Uh, that emoji, bitmoji, I should say, on the screen there is representative of me prior to lockdown, which is uh, may explain why it looks a little bit different from the video uh, version of me that you saw earlier. The haircut has changed and the waistline has changed. Uh, but nevertheless, hopefully that stays in your mind. And my job within Text Help really is to ensure that there is a key focus on teaching and learning first and technology second. Text Help is, of course, a technology company, you'll be aware of us. Uh, but in terms of my job and what I do and the purpose of today is to put teaching and learning first. Technology is there to underpin quality teaching and learning for both our colleagues, our educators, and also for our students. Uh, but it's very important as we go through today that we always put that at the fore. But there's another thing that's very important and very close to our hearts in Text Help, and of course me uh, in my role, is to ensure that when we look at that, that actually the technology that's underpinning teaching and learning can provide genuine and true accessibility for all of our students. So we wanna look at teaching and learning first, but we want to ensure that that is underpinned by good technology and that that is driven by an assurance that that technology provides equity of access and supports all of our diverse range of students that we all serve on a daily basis. And in terms of text help, uh, this is not a sales pitch, as you can probably tell from my rule, uh, but just to put it in perspective as to where we come from, um, our focus is, of course, to deliver accessible teaching and learning. The product you may well have heard of from us is uh, Read and Write, and used by over 30 million students uh, across the globe, will be familiar to many of the students that you may uh, well work with, whether that's through DSA or whether that's through uh, a full campus license. Uh, and so that's what we're really well known for, the support of access to literacy and language and support of that. But of course, we focus also on things like digital maths. How do we provide accessibility there? How do we provide accessibility within simple writing tasks? And also how do we make websites more accessible? Not just tick the boxes, but deliver true and meaningful accessible technology on top of a typical current website. But let's just focus on the job at hand today in our session. And that of course, uh, is around choice and voice. And I thought I'd share with you just the outcomes of a few questions that we asked a body of students in the academic year 2018 to 2019. Uh, and so we set about targeting around about 1,600 students across tertiary education. So that stretched about 40% or so from further education and the balance from higher education. We wanted to get their feel for technology and their feel for their view on technology and what was important to them. And I should stress that whilst these pupils were uh, picked uh, fully at random by the institutions, there was a, a really clear representation of students that we would traditionally support within Text Hub in terms of those students with uh, a requirement for individual needs or supports through technology. So it's a, it's, it's a good wide reaching sample. So let me share with you the first question. The first question was this, what technology 
helps you most. So in your studies, what technology helps you most? Uh, and a very surprising result from this one. Um, again, we only asked them uh, five questions in this small survey. But the number one thing that came back was this, actually digital resources. And I'll start to explain perhaps some of the rationale behind this as we go through the presentation today. But 92% of the students that responded say said that digital resources were the thing that benefited them most. And to give you an idea of some of the other questions we asked them, we asked them, uh, is it digital resources? Uh, is it a better VLE? Is it more use uh, in the classroom? Is it simply access to devices? Or is it a better assistive technology tools? 92% said digital resources. And we'll come to why that's really important as we go through the presentation today. So the next question was, what thing do you want when it comes to technology? What thing do you want when it comes to technology? And this surprised us as well. And 84% of students said choice. So for 84% of all students uh, across our sample, they said they wanted more choice in the technology that they use to access their courses. And again, to share with you some of the other options they had, they had the option of choosing richer resources, uh, choice of technology, as we've said, uh, better knowledge in staff. Do you need the staff to improve to help you in your learning? Do you need better technology on class? Or you do, do you need access to more assistive technology? 84% said, we simply want to choose the technology that we use, not have it directly dictated to us. And the last question that I'm going to share with you today, and you can have access to this full survey uh, after the session today, of course, by contacting our friends at NADP or myself directly. The last question was this, out of 10, how would you rate your lecturer stroke teacher's understanding of technology? So do your teachers or lecturers understand how you use technology and do they understand how to use it to the best of their ability to benefit you? Okay, so that's really what we're driving at. How do you rate your lecturer teacher's understanding of technology? Surprising for some, maybe not surprising for others. 3.2 was the average in that. So from 1 to 10, 3.2 is how students perceive uh, educators in terms of their understanding of how technology can help with individual learning. And incidentally, the flip side of that question was how did they rate themselves? They rated themselves as an 8.9 in terms of their use of technology. So they obviously felt as students that they understood technology considerably better than the teaching staff that were with them. And all of these questions are very interesting and have a, a considerable sway on how we look at choice and voice. And some of the things that we can start to draw out from this, we know that there is digital capital within our students. And what I mean by that, that there is digital knowledge of tools, of devices within our student population. Clearly, they're using it in their everyday lives. Clearly, they have understood and built coping strategies and mechanisms to use the rich variety of tools that mobile devices or tablets or desktops can offer them to help support the individual way they learn and indeed, of course, their individual needs. So there's digital capital there. We need to recognize that. And this is important as we move through to giving students choice and voice because we have to recognize that the capital and the knowledge is actually there. But on the flip side of that, we have to recognize a second thing. And I hope you all know this and share this from your work with your students, that there are is a complex relationship with technology, particularly assistive technology when it comes to students. So yes, we have students that can grasp the technology quickly and easily and understand how to apply it to support them. But equally, we will have a diverse range of students who may struggle with independent ways to use technology, will struggle with individual strategies as to how that technology that's been presented to them has actually been able to support them or how it can be used for perhaps other needs. So we have to recognize there's capital there. But we also need to understand that we need to be able to support that complex relationship that they have. Students thinking they have detailed knowledge of technology and actually applying that to support their individual ways and approaches and needs to learning 
is perhaps another thing. And that's why it's why it's important that we move on and we consider the two things at hand that frame this original presentation. And the first one is, of course, choice. Students already highlight this. And why choice is important in this case is we understand that by giving students a wide variety of choice in what they use to frame their learning in terms of technology and how they use it are two very different things. Because we find students choose to use particular pieces of assistive technology or perhaps just technology in general and may not be for the particular reason that they've been issued to them. So a student who perhaps has visual impairment may well find that a more general piece of technology is useful to them outside of simply what they've been assessed on and been provided with. By providing them with a wider range of of tools and more choice, we can enable them to build, envelop and create their own coping uh, strategies uh, with the widest range of technology tools. And remember, the purpose of today is to focus on choice and voice as it relates to technology. It's a much wider session to think about student choice and voice in terms of how and what and why um, uh, they have motivation for learning. So we'll stick with technology for today. So choice is very important. And secondly, of course, voice, that student voice to be able to contribute, to be able to articulate what it is they need and how they need to use it and how that can uh, develop and envelop their pursuit of learning. Really, really important that we offer these two things. And if we think about those things together and how they might manifest themselves, within our own environments. They work hand in hand. There is no use having one without the other in terms of moving forward, particularly when it comes to technology. And what that looks like is simply this. When we start to provide students with choice in what they need to equip them for learning, the tools that they need to utilize to uh, enhance their learning experience and give them equity of access. That choice gives power to voice. And it's a very clear circular motion because as they have more and more choice, they feel empowered, they feel more strategic in their approach to learning. And that encourages them to put forward their voice in terms of what they need. And that, uh, in my experience, has contributed very directly to their voice input directly to lecturers and to teachers in terms of their overall approach to learning, their motivation to learning uh, and the subject areas that they want to focus on. So choice gives power to voice. Now, as we think about those two things, how does that look if you, if you combine choice and voice? What are some of the essential ingredients within that? If a pupil, a student, is has the choice to make those sorts of decisions in terms of what helps them with learning, has the voice uh, to, uh, 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 to express how exactly they want to contribute or direct their own learning, perhaps set their own goals, then the two things add up and they add up in these two different ways. Number one, what a student can start to see from choice and voice is a sense of integrity. Integrity in terms of how they are undertaking their learning. Integrity in terms of being able to acknowledge that there is a diverse range of students around them and that they themselves approach learning in a very different way. They will recognize the integrity of that. But also as they start to embrace choice and voice, the second thing that becomes really apparent to students, <coughs> excuse me, is the efficacy of what they are doing. The ability to make that choice of the technology that they would use to help them with learning starts to lend itself to efficacy in what they're learning and their the difficulties that they may well face, the challenges that they may well face, and the coping strategies that they built as a result of those choices that they have made. And of course, that leads into a further circle of them being able to develop those choices, hone those choices into something that can be more meaningful and useful to them going forward. 
And if you take those two things, integrity and efficacy, what does that start to turn into as we go forward? So we start with choice and voice. We start to deliver choice. We start to enable voice. Students start to see the integrity of that approach. They start to see the efficacy and the benefits in that approach. Well, what we're really doing by providing choice and voice, whether it's in learning or whether it's in technology, is this. We're starting to provide the core elements of student agency. Because by delivering that choice and voice, we're also enabling things like activation of prior knowledge. We're giving them hopefully increased engagement with the content, with the subject matter at hand, because we're making it more accessible. We're hopefully motivating them in that, uh, in that process. Through voice, we're hopefully giving them a better purpose. We're clearly giving them a very clear ownership. Uh, of everything that they do. That all comes back around to self-efficacy that you can see directly on slides uh, in front of you. And these are really, really important areas and they are a symptom or a consequence of embracing choice and voice. And perhaps that is only through technology, which is where we started today. But that of course has huge and wider implications to exactly how students want to learn and the terms that they want to learn on, not just how they are supported by technology per se. And student agency is really key. And actually the OECD report Education 2030 makes, uh, makes it very clear that equity of access and accessibility is critical for learning going forward in their vision. But actually the number one thing that they put above all simply because it applies to all students is this concept of student agency. And the only path forward to student agency is to start to ensure that all students have that choice and voice. And again, today is simply about choice and voice with the technology tools that they can use to give them the widest range of accessibility and address their individual needs in a way that supports and helps them. But agency is very clearly front and center uh, with many uh, discussions and plans that are taking place right now. And of course, in the last few months, We've also seen uh, inevitably the huge rise in online learning uh, and choice and voice has perhaps never been more important when it comes to whether we're attending lectures in person in, uh, in class or whether we are uh, attending lectures and accessing material online. To a degree at some stages, accessibility hasn't been front and center at the very start of a remote learning. Thankfully, that is starting to increase. But what we have found through this period of remote learning is that by giving students the widest choice of technology tools, the widest access to platforms, and giving them also a range of very specific tools that we know through our own experience as practitioners can help them, that it has enabled them to start to choose and find and explore what can help make learning uh, more equitable in a fully digitally embraced age. And of course we know going forward that things are subject to change. Uh, some of you will be going back to full-time classes. Uh, others will have a longer period of remote learning. And it's important, therefore, that we build our students to be independent with their use of technology and give them the widest range of tools that they possibly can. So let's look at if we consider that choice and voice is important to students, it's important to build agency, it's important to equip them with coping strategies that they need in terms of the wide variety of technology. What are the key steps that we can start to take some of these you will have taken already, and some of these are absolutely worth some consideration going forward. And there's three core areas that we need to consider. And the first one is flexibility. Flexibility in terms of the digital resources that our students have asked for, flexibility in the way in which we present those, and flexibility in which the way that students can interpret and utilize those. We need to equip students with the tools, the technology tools that they can use to embrace their learning with ease. No point giving flexible resources if we don't give them the tools to support that. And of course, we then need to recognize that some of our tasks need to change there. So we wanna look at those first two really in terms of the scope that we have in our presentation today. Flexibility and tools. 
And the first thing that, and the most important thing from my perspective is this, embracing universal design for learning. Now, I know that many of the members of NADP will be fully versed in universal design for learning, NADP, great advocates of change and implementation for universal design for learning. But there may, of course, be some of you on this presentation who are not familiar with it. And I'm going to put it in its very, very simplest forms because universal design for learning deserves hours and hours of time all on its own to help you explore and then take a deep dive into just how it can support the students that you work with in your particular role. But if we think about universal design for learning, for me, I want to break it down into its basics. And its basics for me is it is a framework. And it was developed by cast.org. A link uh, is on your screen and you can access that from the presentation after today. And Universal Design for Learning provides a really clear yet simple framework to show us how we can start to adapt our approach to teaching and to learning and to technology and all of the points in between that can ensure that we deliver our teaching and learners learn on uh, in the widest variety of ways possible. And why do we do that? We do that because we want to, at all costs, remove any barriers to learning uh, by our students or for our students. So think about universal design for learning just for the purposes of the day as that simple framework. Much more to it. But in its very simplest terms, universal design for learning simply considers these three individual areas that we should be planning for multiple means of engagement. So that is not engagement in the shiny button and sh flash and light sense of engagement as sometimes um, uh, some uh, technology companies have considered as engagement. That is about building motivation. Uh, that is about building on prior knowledge. That is about working together uh, with your peers uh, directly on engagement. There's much more to it than that, but in simplest terms, multiple ways that we can engage students in learning. But then there's multiple ways that we want to have uh, those materials, that content, that teaching represented. So one student may, of course, um, uh, grab a digital resource uh, online. They may use then a text-to-speech tool. They may be able to play that back. But perhaps that student would be more comfortable with a file that is sent to them that is directly an audio book. Perhaps that student would be more comfortable and find it more accessible where that is enriched uh, for their own individual supports. For example, it's highly visual rather than highly textual. Uh, so there are many ways that we want to be able to represent. And technology kind of plugs directly into that representation side for me because representation may well require us to rethink our approach and in fact does our approach to resources, but it also should be empowering to the student to give them the technology tools that can have any resources that they gather easily repurposed in just a few buttons to help support them in the ways that they uh, uh, need supported. And then of course there's expression. So UDL calls for multiple means of expression alternative ways for assessment, for articulation, for representation of learning. To give students the widest range of technology tools and access to those, including assistive technology, can help to start deliver that. So universal design for learning for me is by far and away the number one thing that we can start to pursue that really helps us embrace and encourage and enable choice and voice. When we do that, we start to create a different breed of learners. We start to create those learners that are purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable and strategic and goal directed. So there are many more outcomes from universal design for learning than uh, providing students with the choice of accessing resources and engaging with learning in uh, uh, ways and alternative ways that may suit them better or support their individual needs. We also have a huge upside to this as well. Um, and so UDL for me is number one. So what's number two? Number two, when we think about choice and voice for me, uh, moves on to staff CPD. And staff CPD, of course, think about how we might embrace something like UDL. 
that's a huge change within an organizational structure and within culture and requires a commitment of time. It requires a commitment of CPD and is, of course, a journey uh, for everyone involved in the process. But there are things that we can start to do in terms of CPD that can start to encourage student choice of voice. We talked earlier on about the recognition that students have digital capital. They have knowledge, they have built coping strategies. We need to be able to listen to our students through their voice and understand what helps and supports them best and not simply make a straightforward assessment of what it is we think they need and a recognition that tools are all very different. So our colleagues, our teachers, our lecturers, our peers that we work with, need to have access to student voice within that. That's empowering for the student and empowering for the teacher. And that has to be a fundamental part of CPD. We have to have other things within there as well in terms of we need to incorporate blended learning within that approach because what students use in terms of assistive technology or technology in general in the classroom may well be very different than what they access at home and on, say, a mobile device. So we need to approach CPD differently and we need to enforce this concept of choice and voice within that. Um, and so there's a whole session again on CPD in here. So these are just guidelines. So number one, UDL. Uh, starts to enable choice and voice very, very clearly. It's it's absolutely ingrained in the framework. Number two, a modification of CPD to ensure that within that, we have students as a very central part of the voice within that. And when it comes to technology, to start to express exactly how they, uh, they use technology to support it. So number three then, so UDL, CPD, number three is actually an alternative provision of devices. The mobile culture that we have all lived in for the last number of years has been critical for many, many students with an assistive technology need. Uh, those students have, again, we come back to it, they have developed strategies and coping strategies. They have used apps. They have used the inbuilt assistive technology tools within mobile devices uh, to help them both in their daily lives and in their learning. And it's really important that when we talk about choice, that we don't think about simply choice in a desktop environment on a laptop, that we think how that technology may be utilized on any device. So that aspect of choice is not based on a platform, is not based on a specific device, but it gives students the freedom and the flexibility to choose the technology tools that work in any of the environments that may well suit them best, rather than prescribing a straightforward device. We have to recognize these and allow for those. And then last and definitely not least, um, the point I suppose of the conversation today is what do we think about tech and how can tech start to enable this choice in voice? So we've said UDL through the technology lens, we can ensure UDL principles are enshrined directly within the technology we use. CPD, technology at the heart of CPD, but student voice articulating how they may benefit from technology different platforms, the technology has to be used there. But the bottom line for technology is that it gives students this. It gives them something that is flexible, that is adaptable, and that is personal. By giving students choice in the technology that they use to support their needs, these three areas become more and more and more apparent and more important because students need to be flexible. We said earlier that one student's particular assistive technology tool that they may well have been given uh, or provided access to within your institution may well on the surface suit their needs, but we don't always understand all of the minor changes and features that are there within a particular technology tool. So providing them with the widest range of tools enables them to be very flexible. It enables them to be adaptable and most importantly, enables them to be personal choice is critical within that. But let's just stop and think for a moment or two about assistive technology, okay? And assistive technology, I have to be on, honest, is not um, a, a phrase that I use overly. And uh, I don't slight away from the phrase. 
Uh, it's very important to our industry and to our students, of course, number one. Um, but I want just for the purposes of the day to explain why that may well be the case from my perspective. I think we need to look at how we define assistive technology. And we don't put assistive technology in a very specific um, box that helps only some students. Because if we are to think about inclusion, this is really, really important. I'm going to go through this. And one of my favorite definitions of assistive technology is the original uh, GISC definition that was uh, uh, detailed uh, back in a paper in 2007. And they still hold it to this day. And that's this. What is assistive technology? Well, it's any technology that broadens the range of learning experiences offered to students. There is no mention of individual needs or specific learning needs or anything within that. And I think that's a fabulous way to think about assistive technology. It's just any, underline any technology that broadens the range of learning experiences offered to students. Give students choice and give them voice in what they need and use from a technology standpoint. And this exactly defines it. Any technology that broadens the range of learning experiences offered to students. So let's think about assistive technology slightly differently. Let's think about assistive technology without labels. Why? Because what we find in an all-inclusive environment is that we do not have segregation within there, as you see on screen. We do not provide or need to provide very specific tools to that segregated area. If we provide choice to all of those students, all of those students in exactly the same way, then they learn from one another and they build much deeper coping strategies and strategies to use technology. So providing no labels on technology in general enables students to make a greater choice and enables them to make a greater choice that empowers, enables, supports, and helps them. Take, for example, something like uh, text-to-speech, which is built into our very own Read and Write. Text-to-speech, of course, is a fabulous tool. Those students with dyslexia, uh, those students with uh, ADHD, those students that need that extra uh, uh, help when it comes to reading and consuming material, perhaps simply reducing cognitive load, that very same tool is incredibly useful for students who perhaps don't have dyslexia, but could uh, use text to speech to help them in generalized research, study, review, exam, prep, and uh, uh, preparation and revision. So when we start to provide the widest range of technology, we start to give every student access to the tool. And what happens there is we have less stigma with regards to these tools, but also we have more choice. That leads directly to voice that we've said before, and most importantly, it leads directly to students having better outcomes because they have that wider range of options. And continuing in that read and write theme, and I talked about it very, very loosely at the start, and many of you may well be familiar with the read and write product. But one of the things that we've done within read and write is try to take, first of all, design it around UDL principles that we talked about earlier, ensure that the tools that we built in provide students with choice in multiple different ways to access, consume, and learn from any content online, on PDF, uh, or in Google Docs or Word. So we give them a menu of tools that they can use. And the widest range of tools and technology that we can offer can support the widest range of students. So we can have text-to-speech, we can have dictation, we can enable students to flip content into uh, an audible file. We enable magnification, highlight, study, voice notes are very powerful there as well. So for students with a wide variety of needs or a combination of needs, tools like Read and Write, multiple ways to approach their learning are fundamentally important. Uh, and then we extend that, of course, into things like maths as well, because if we start to provide the widest range of technology tools, if I take a question, a question is really useful at creating maths content, but it's even better when it's used with a standardized screen reader, because all of a sudden we now have accessible maths, but we need to be able to be providing students with a full catalog 
of uh, technology in order for them to benefit from that. So they'll need a screen reader, they'll need a Quatio, they'll need access to these tools. This can help students with visual impairment, pupils who uh, have dyscalculia, dyspraxia, uh, uh, pupils that have uh, verbal um, impediments as well. So there are many, many ways by providing the widest variety of tools designed around UDL principles, that can help these students out. So really important when you look at technology that you consider have they been created around UDL because what does UDL give? UDL gives choice and that's what's fundamentally important as we go through our presentation. And if you think about small changes, think back to CPD, things that we could do within CPD. If we take a typical lecture, we could, of course, by one button press as part of our CPD and as part of increasing our understanding of technology with our colleagues, add one button to our browser, this little button here called Screencastify. What does that enable a lecturer or teacher to do? One button, record everything he or she says and shows on her screen. Think about that for remote learning. Think about the ramifications for choice. Think about the ramifications for accessibility. One button press and everything has been recorded. We've now given students a different way to access the content and that's all we've asked our colleagues to do. And this is very, very important that we start to provide this range of choice to our students. So take that, take a, a colleague presenting a piece of content that traditionally they may well have shared out as a PowerPoint file or something more static through a VLE. If they do it live by pressing that screen record button, now all they've got to do in PowerPoint in, uh, in uh, any presentation tool like Google Slides uh, and Apple's Keynote, they can start those captions when they start to talk and without doing one other thing throughout that presentation, they have closed captions. Some students who don't even require closed captions will read and consume that content better. Why? Because they have the choice to do so. Those students with individual needs, of course, benefit hugely from having those there. But not all of them will use them. Not all of them will need access. Many of them may well listen rather than read, depending on their individual circumstances. But what do we do by doing these very small steps? We're giving students choice. And choice is the most important thing that we can do to build more resilient and robust students with technology that can really support them. And so as we go through just a our final uh, few slides, I just wanna leave a couple of things with you. And the first one is this, please, please, please don't think about technology when we consider it for our students as the daily special. Think about this as a menu. We don't want to have one tool that uh, can support an individual need that we have identified. That's not enough. We need to give students choice. We don't even want to give students an a la carte menu in this case. We don't and shouldn't pursue giving them a limited range of options where it's difficult for them to find the one that fits them. What we really need to pursue when we think about choice and voice with technology is a full buffet. Access to the widest range of tools, whilst understanding that our students, as we said at the outset, have a complex relationship with technology, we of course need to be able to support our students in that and give them guidance, but we do constantly need to provide them with the widest range of tools to do that. Focus in on those specials, those individual tools that we know support students over and above anything else but still give them access to the widest range. We don't know how each of our students learn. We don't know the intricacies of their individual needs or challenges or approaches to learning. By giving them these tools, we make them resilient and we build in strategies that they need to learn on an equitable and equal access. So as we go through our summary, choice and voice where we started today, and again, we were focused directly on choice and voice through technology. That gives us the capability to increase work, the amount of work, the quality of work, increase focus, increase interest, make our students uh, more tenacious as they go, be more supported. We add challenge because they have self-directed voice and choice within that. We increase their goals 
And most importantly for me within this, we increase their coping strategy capability. We give them the tools they need to succeed. That's ultimately for me what choice and voice is about. And that's how it's evidenced itself through all of the interaction I've had everywhere from primary, secondary, through to tertiary level and into the world of work when it comes to utilizing technology tools. When we do that, we start to remove the model of segregated access to assistive technology. Yes, we address the specific needs, but by providing the choice, our students learn from their colleagues and their peers. They learn to use mainstream tools as well, which is what they'll have access to beyond into the world of work. Providing that core toolkit, based on those fundamental essentials, things like read and write and equatio and, and things like JAWS screen reader, those core tools are very important but it's equally as important to give them access and create true inclusion when we do that. Everybody, every stakeholder needs to be involved from teachers to IT to our students. Everybody needs a voice if we are to pursue this and give students the right technology tools to use. A lot of what we've said here today is underpinned and uh, uh, underlined by universal design for learning. It's crucially important. If there's one takeaway from today, look closer at universal design for learning if you're not already doing so. And again, I know many of you will be. But think about when it comes to technology, ensuring that those technology tools are designed with universal design for learning in mind and not designed for single use. They're designed to give students the flexibility. That's the single most important thing we can do. And finally, in terms of general advice moving forward, when I do talks like this, we try and instigate change and promote student choice and voice and UDL and the importance of those things. Access for me is the core thing. And I'm a big fan of acronyms and access is a very, very important one. So I'll leave you with this. As we consider student choice and voice. Think about these six areas. When we do so, we provide accessibility for all, true inclusion. We give students the choice. We start to provide the widest possible accessibility. We have no restrictions. We don't place restrictions. We give accessibility for all. We do that through providing comprehensive technology a comprehensive range of technology choices. We provide better CPD. Our colleagues need to understand that the choices students make are there to help support them and not get in the way of learning and that student's voice is critical to that CPD curve. From that, what do we achieve? We achieve empowerment for our students. We in achieve a strategic nature in our students because they carefully pick the tools that uniquely and specifically suit and help to support them. And last and definitely not least, we start to work toward true student agency, where our students are genuinely, regardless of their individual need, have access to uh, the tools that they need to promote agency, to take ownership, to build strategies, and to increase their independence moving forward. So with that in mind, I just want to thank you very much uh, for your time today. Um, I really, really do appreciate it. I'd also like to thank NADP for having me here today uh, and having me as a guest on this virtual conference 2020. I do hope to be back. In the meantime, uh, I'm sure there'll be follow-ups with some of these resources directly from uh, your friends at NADP. But from me, you can reach out and get me at edtech at texthelp.com and at th underscore Patrick M. Uh, and so that very clearly rounds up today. I think we're now going to go into a Q&A session. And I'm really looking forward to taking any questions that you indeed may have. So thank you again. Uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of the summer. Uh, and uh, please do stay safe. Uh, and of course, in the last few months, do stay sane and promote your own health and well-being uh, within the nature of everything that we're all experiencing together. Thank you.